Good morning and welcome to our online service at Beverly Hills Baptist Church. Today, we are celebrating our Savior because he lives. This morning, we're going to sing um, the hymn, Because He Lives, to reflect on the fact that our Savior was buried and rose again for us and was sacrificed. And we are just so thankful to be able to be here to worship him this morning. If you're at home, I ask you to sing out with me. Most of you will know these words to this song as we sing, Because He Lives. Welcome everyone to Beverly Hills Baptist Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, it is uh, a beautiful Sunday morning that it is, in fact, our Sunday morning, Easter morning. Uh, we praise that the Lord has risen from the grave and we praise his name and we are so excited to be here. Uh, I have just a few announcements this morning. Uh, our first announcement is that we want to say thank you to all of those who have been sending in their tithes and offerings 
uh, for the continual support here at Beverly Hills. Uh, that has been amazing. Uh, the Lord is still working in the background and the church is still running and we just praise the Lord and thank you for your contributions for that. Also, uh, our drive-in uh, Easter uh, Sunday afternoon drive-in has been postponed uh, due to inclement weather. We uh, decided that this would be best due to the weather that is coming and with the upcoming restrictions with the coronavirus. Uh, so uh, we encourage you this afternoon to spend time with your family and your loved ones. Uh, and just reflect on this beautiful Easter day. Uh, also, if you have any prayer requests, uh, please feel free to send those in. Uh, you can mail those, you can email those, you can uh, phone call, uh, and you can even leave those in the comment section below uh, on Facebook or even in YouTube. Uh, and we are continuing to update our prayer list and sending that out uh, each week. Uh, so if you do have prayer requests, please don't hesitate. Uh, but today is just a beautiful day. Uh, at this time, we are going to open up with a word of prayer, and then we will have a special music. Our Father and our God, we love you and we praise you. We thank you that we can gather here to worship you. And that this beautiful day, this Easter morning, and Father God, that many, many years ago that Jesus rose from the grave. And that he died and paid the penalty for our sins. And that he arose from the grave. And that, Father, he conquered death, hell, and the grave, and that he showed to be our Savior and our Lord. We thank you, Father, that we can gather here to worship you. Our prayer, Father, is that for those who do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that you would move in a mighty way. That you would begin to open hearts and minds using uh, this virus and this quarantine to those who now have time to sit and to reflect. We pray that you would just open their, their hearts and their minds. That the gospel will be reached to them and that they will come to know you as Lord and Savior. We pray, Father, that your name is honored and glorified in all the nations. And it is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. This morning, the song that I picked um, is called He Grew the Tree. And I picked this song because it always makes me reflect a little differently than just from Friday to Sunday, from Good Friday to Resurrection Sunday. And the reason is, is because the words are so detailed about how even from the beginning of time, God looked down and he knew that every day growing closer and closer, his son would be sacrificed for us. And he never changed his plan. He never backed out. He never decided, you know what? They didn't follow me today. I'm done with them. He was faithful to us every single day. And he still grew the tree um, that Christ was sacrificed on. And the thought that the, that the Lord delights in even the tiniest of details from the beginning of time tells me that my God who lives is involved in every detail of my life and yours as well. And so when I sing this song today, listen to the words if you've not heard it before. It just means a lot when you think about how incredibly detailed, involved our Lord is in our lives. <laughs> A small lonely hill that he knew would be called Calvary. They made the sea that would grow to be thorns that would make his son. Then he made a green stem 
turn with me in your Bibles to the Gospel of John, John chapter 19. John chapter 19, and we will begin in verse 1. My question for you this morning is this. Do you believe in the resurrection? Do you believe that someone could be raised from the dead? Now, in our world today, it has been said many a times that the only thing that is guaranteed is death. That is the only thing that we are promised in life. We are promised nothing but that this life, this physical life, will come to an end. But if we read the scriptures and we believe them, we know that this isn't the final cause, that there is life after we pass away. But do we believe, do you believe that someone can be raised from the dead? When we look at Bible doctrines and we study them, the second most denied doctrine of the Bible is the resurrection. There are more people who doubt the resurrection than any other doctrine in the Bible except the virgin birth. Uh, as we know how these things take place, that it takes a mother and a father to have a child but we also understand that no one, when they pass from this life to the next, comes back to life. But do you believe in the resurrection? Uh, in this beautiful Easter morning, I want to take a look at the realities of Easter. 
I don't want to take out four realities that make up what we call Easter Sunday. The first thing I want to take a look at is the reality of his death. Our scripture begins in John 19 and verse 1. Uh, John writes, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and threw a purple robe on him. And they repeatedly came up to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and were slapping his face. Now Pilate went outside again and said to them, Look, I bring him outside to show you, to let you know that I find no grounds for charging him. The first part of Jesus' crucifixion, uh, the first part of his death, we take a look at what must first take place. The Roman crucifixion was one of the most gruesome uh, ways to put someone to the death. Now, typically speaking, when we talk about a Roman crucifixion, we talk about the thieves that were tied to a cross and that they were left there until they would suffocate or succumb to the elements. But because of the heinous nature of how Jesus was punished, uh, those who were in charge of this took things just a few steps further. The scripture tells us that Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. Now, these few words uh, don't convey what actually really took place within uh, the death of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was taken and he was laid bare. His clothes were completely taken off of him and he was laid across a stump. And in this, they would begin, the Roman soldiers would begin by taking what we in the South call hickory switches. They would take these rods or these reeds and they would begin to beat the intended victim from the back of his knees all the way up to the back of his neck. The purpose of this would be uh, to begin to bruise and, if you will, begin to tenderize the flesh. It would begin to cause a bleeding to well up underneath the skin, and it would begin to uh, create great pain for the intended victim. But that was not only what took place in the first part of the flogging of Christ. Then after the Roman citizens, uh, the Roman soldiers, excuse me, would then take a cat of nine tails, a leather whip with uh, pieces of bone and a potsherd tied to the end, and they would begin to whip Jesus. And what this would do is that this whipping would literally begin to peel the skin from his bones. Uh, it would begin to lacerate the skin, and they would continue to do this over and over and over. Uh, Roman history teaches us that if you were to survive 40 lashings from a Roman soldier, then you could be proven to be innocent and to be let go. History tells us that most, uh, if not just about every single uh, criminal that was uh, flogged with the cat of nine tails usually made it to around six or seven lashes before they succumb to bleeding out. The scripture tells us that Jesus survived 39 lashes, but he never made it to 40 because they did not want to find him innocent. After they then flogged him with the cat of nine tails and he would be covered in scratches and deep cuts from head to toe. And they then took him up, they stood him up, and they began to twist together a crown of thorns. And they would then press this into his skull. They would press this into his scalp. Now, if you've ever lived in the south and you've walked in the woods, you know what a thicker bush is. If you've ever had roses... You know what kind of little thorns grow on those. We're not talking those type of thorns. We are talking thorns of a bush that was grown in the area that would have two or three inch uh, prongs on them. They pressed this into his skull and they threw a, a purple uh, robe around him. And they be, uh, repeatedly began to call him, Hail Jesus, King of the Jews. And they were slapping his face. The other gospel tells us that they would begin to pull the facial hair out of his face. And they would begin to torture him. This was just the beginning of what Jesus was going to endure. Our scripture it carries on and takes us into 
uh, John chapter 19 and verse 17. It says, Therefore they took Jesus away, carrying his own cross, and he went out to the place called uh, the Skulls, or in the Hebrew is called Golgotha. And there they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. Now, as I would say, after they had tortured Jesus and they had uh, put this robe on him and they had pulled out all of his facial hair and they had beat him with a cat of nine tails to the point, as the scripture tells us, that his visage was unrecognizable, uh, that he could hardly be recognized as a man. They gave him his own cross and they made him carry it up to a place called Golgotha, which is known as the place of the skulls. Uh, in Hebrew tradition, this was a hill where Roman citizens would be crucified so that anyone throughout the city could see the criminals hanging and know that they were guilty for what they had done. Here Jesus is uh, carrying his own cross and he is led up into uh, the place of the skulls and they lay him down on this cross. Now, as I had mentioned before, most uh, soldiers uh, would take their intended victim and they would tie their arms and their legs using ropes to bind them. But as the scripture tells us, Jesus was not only tied, but he was nailed to the cross. Uh, history teaches us that Jesus was pierced through the bottoms of his wrist so that his weight would hold him on the cross. If he had been nailed through the palms of his hands, his weight would not have been able to uphold him. We know that by crucifying someone and nailing them through the wrist between the ulna and the radius, that this creates more pain as it puts more uh, weight and pressure on the junctions of the wrist. He was then nailed uh, through his ankles, and nailing him to the cross, ensuring that he was not going to come down from this cross. The scripture tells us that he was crucified between two others, one on his left and one on his right. We know from history that one of these mocked him, but the other cried out, Remember me. Remember me when you are in paradise. As Jesus was crucified on the cross, uh, it carries on that the day of preparation, verse 31. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath. For the Sabbath was a special day. They requested that Pilate have the men's legs broken, that their bodies be taken away. And history tells us that if you were to be crucified on the cross and that you were tied after a certain time, if you did not expire, if you live beyond what their expectations were, if you were able to survive the elements, they would take a large wooden hammer and they would shatter the legs of the criminal so that their body weight would then begin to slowly sag. And as they would begin to sag, they would succumb to breathing problems as they would squish their own diaphragm. And they would begin to suffocate slowly. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and then the one of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs since they saw that he was already dead. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. And he who saw this has testified so that you may believe. Here, the John, the writer of the gospel, says that I, I say this so that you may believe his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth. For these things happen so that the scripture would be filled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And the other scripture says that they will pierce his side. Here, John tells us that in the final moments of the crucifixion, that the soldiers come. And then seeing that Jesus has already passed away, instead of, uh, uh, instead of breaking his legs, they take the spear and they pierce his side. And as they open up his side, blood and water come pouring out. And it is the last of what remains of the life of Jesus. Jesus has now passed away. His life has been extinguished. He has died. For the sins of mankind. This is the reality of his death. 
We read through just a few verses of Scripture, but we have to understand that the crucifixion took hours. And this was the pain that Jesus would endure. It wasn't a simple scratch. It wasn't just a simple cut where Jesus shed just a little blood for the forgiveness of sins, but that all of his blood, everything that was within him was poured out for the sins of mankind. You see, God's wrath was poured out upon Jesus Christ, and the blood of Christ was poured out to cover that wrath for mankind. Jesus gave his life as a ransom so that mankind could be in right standing with God. It wasn't just a little that had to be poured out. It wasn't just a scratch. It was his entire life. He had to give everything that he was for the sins of the children. That is the reality of his death. But the second thing I want us to take a look at in John chapter 19, verses 38 and 42, is the reality of his burial. Now after this, John chapter 19, verse 38, John writes, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jews, asked Pilate, that he might remove Jesus' body. Now Pilate gave him permission, and so he came and took his body away. Now Nicodemus, who had previously come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe. Then they took Jesus' body, and they wrapped it in linen cloth with aromatic spices, according to the burial customs of the Jews. And there was a garden in the place where he was crucified. A new tomb was in the garden. No one had yet been placed in it. And they placed Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation and since the tomb was nearby. Jesus' burial, we see that uh, Joseph of Arimathea comes and asks Pilate if he may remove the body. Now, it says here that Joseph of Arimathea was a disciple of Jesus, but he was secretly because he feared the Jews. I could understand here why John was saying this. John being one of the very faithful uh, believers and disciples that stayed alongside Mary, uh, the mother of Jesus, throughout all of this. But here, every Jew that is in existence who got uh, in this point saw how dangerous the Roman people were. They see how vicious the Roman government can be. I could understand how the Jews were scared because no one in history past had been crucified and tortured the way Christ had been. I could understand how Joseph of Arimathea being scared, seeing that they took this innocent man and crucified him. But yet he comes in faithfulness and he asks Pilate if he can remove the body. Pilate gives him permission. And then Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees who had uh, had a conversation with Jesus in the past, who knew who Jesus was. And we believe that Nicodemus became a believer. And they take this uh, aloe, 75 pounds of myrrh and aloe, and they wrap Jesus' body. And they wrap it in aromatics, and they wrap it in this burial cloth, and they take him to a garden. They take him to a tomb that is nearby, where Jesus will be placed. And we see that the stone will be rolled in front of this, and that Jesus is laid to rest in the grave. Now the reality of our burial says that Jesus is in the tomb. But what is taking place in the background? You see, what you must understand about the reality of his burial is that while Jesus is laying in the tomb, his physical body is lying in this empty tomb. But Jesus himself, Jesus in his spirit, is in the uh, eternity. He is in hell, and he is preaching the gospel to those who have held captive. As we read in the scriptures, we see that there was a place called Abraham's bosom. And there was a place of Sheol. And these two were separated by a gulf where each one of those uh, could see one another. All of the Old Testament saints up to this point went to be in Abraham's bosom. It was a place of happiness and bliss. 
Jesus went into what we call Sheol. He went into where the captives were. Those who had not made a belief. Those who were not part of the covenant family. And Jesus in his state begins to preach to them. He begins to preach to them to those who did not believe. He begins to preach to those who were not part of the covenant. He begins to preach to them and he tells them that he is the one who will in three days resurrect. And for three days, Jesus spends his life in eternity hell for there. And he preaches the gospel to them and he tells them what they are missing. He tells them that he is God himself and that he will rise again. He tells them that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And he is in this time preaching to those who did not believe. This is the reality of his burial. In these three days, while Jesus' body lies in the tomb and he preaches to the captives in Sheol, the disciples sit about, worrying, pondering the words of what Jesus had told them. Jesus told them that he had to go away for a little while and that he was going to suffer. I don't believe that they fully understood that he would give his life completely as he did. The disciples sit and they, and they mourn and they grieve. And the scripture tells us that in this time that Jesus uh, put John in charge of watching over his mother. I can only imagine that John... Spending the past three and a half years with Mary, the mother of Jesus, how he uh, consoles her as she watches as her only son, her oldest born son, was crucified and that his life was taken away because he loved his people. That is the reality of his burial. Not only do we in this Easter Sunday see the reality of his death and the reality of his burial, but we come to the greatest point in Easter, and that is the reality of the resurrection. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 8. And on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark. And she saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have put him. You see, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, those that were responsible for crucifying Jesus, he told them that in three days that he was going to resurrect. He told them. And yet they here believe that he is just a human man, that how can, he, how can he have the power to do this? Nonetheless, it was still in the back of the minds of the Pharisees. So they sealed this tomb with a large rock. They wanted to take no chances that this Jesus was going to come back from the dead. Now, in history, they had only heard of stories in the Old Testament of how uh, men had been raised from the dead, especially the man who had been thrown to the grave of Elijah and was brought back to life. But never, never had a man claiming that he would come back to life like this. They were taking no chances. But here, Mary Magdalene runs to the tomb, and she sees that the stone has been moved away, and she fears that the, the Roman government has taken his body away. She fears that they have removed this Jesus so that they cannot have the proper burial respects to their Lord and to their Savior. She comes and she sees that the stone has moved away and she runs and she tells Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, this is John writing of himself. And she goes and tells Peter and John that they have taken the body away and that he's not there. At that, Peter and the other disciple, that is John, the writer of the Gospel of John, head for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and got to the tomb first. Here, John tells him that he ran faster than Peter could. John ran as hard as he could. He had heard the words of Jesus himself. Jesus had told them that he would resurrect from the dead. John here wants to be the first to see, is this true? Is Jesus alive? Did they take his body away? Did the Romans hide him? Or did Jesus come back from the grave? He runs as fast as he can, outrunning Peter. And he gets to the tomb first. And he stoops down. And he sees the linen cloth 
lying there. Yet he did not go in. He stops and ponders to himself, why is it that I see this cloth? Did they unwrap his body? Or did Jesus really rise from the grave? And then following him, Simon Peter came also. And he entered the tomb and saw the linen cloth lying there. The wrappings that had been on his head was lying with the linen clothes, but it was folded separately in a place by itself. You see, Jesus uh, takes his napkin, uh, this, this head cloth that was wrapped around, and he folds it up and he lays it neatly. Uh, Hebrew tradition tells us that when a Jewish master was in his home and he was eating dinner, that he would take the napkin and when he was finished with his dinner, he would lay it over his plate and that he would walk away signifying to the servants that this was okay for them to clean the table, that he was done, that he was not coming back. But when the Jewish master would take the linen cloth, and he would fold it neatly and he would lay it beside his plate. It signified to the, the, the Jewish, uh, to the uh, servants that he was not finished. And that the master was coming back. And that he would return. When the disciples come, they see that the linen cloths are wrapped around his body. They are laying on the ground. But the one that was wrapped around his head was folded neatly in a separate place. They begin to understand that Jesus is coming back. Jesus is not finished. His three days in hell are up. He is now risen from the grave. He is now alive and he is about. And they realize that Jesus, in fact, is God. That he did not stay in the tomb. That he did not stay there. But being the King of kings, being the Lord of lords, he has risen from the grave and he has come back. That he has paid the penalty for their sins. The other disciple who had reached the tomb first then entered and saw and believed. John solidifies in his heart. He solidifies in his mind. He knows that Jesus has resurrected from the grave. That Jesus is no longer in that tomb and that Jesus has risen Praise God, Jesus has risen from the grave. We do not serve a God who is dead. We do not serve a fake deity. We serve a God who is alive and who is well, who is sitting at the right hand of the Father. We serve a risen Savior. The scriptures in John chapter 20, uh, John continues to write about how Mary Magdalene finally sees the resurrected Savior a few verses later, Jesus appears to Thomas and he allows him to touch the nail-pierced hands uh, and he uh, touches the scarred, the, the spear-pierced side and Thomas sees and believes. A few verses later, we see that Jesus appears to uh, the other disciples and to uh, many other people before he ascends to the Father to where he sits on the right hand. And it tells us in scripture that when Jesus was resurrected from the grave and when he ascended on high to sit at the right hand of the Father, that he took those that were in captivity and he took those that were in Abraham's bosom with him. And that all of believers, all of those who are believers from uh, eternity past, now are in heaven in the presence of God. And that is the reality of the resurrection. That is the reality of understanding Easter. But there is one more reality that we must understand. You see, we've seen the reality of his death. We have seen the reality of his burial. We have seen the reality of the resurrection. But this leads us to the reality of our sins. Romans chapter 3, verses 10, 11, and 12 read, As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks after God. For all have turned aside together, and they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Romans three twenty three tell us, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
my encouragement for you is in, in this Easter time, if you uh, come across this message and you are a believer, that you would begin to search your heart and that you would begin uh, to uh, see that Jesus is uh, our Lord and Savior, and that you would begin to search your heart and that you would begin to ask God to forgive you of your sins. That you would begin to ask God to cleanse you and to change you. And then God would lead you into a better fellowship with him. My prayer for you is that if you are not a believer. That if you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you come across this video uh, via Facebook. You come across it on YouTube. If someone happens to share it and you are not a believer. That you will open up your heart and your mind. And you will cry out to our risen Savior. That you would cry out to Jesus. And you would ask him to forgive you of your sins. And that he would cleanse you from without. That he would begin to cleanse you from within. And that he would bring a new life in you. My prayer is that whether you are a believer or whether you are not. That you will begin to seek the face of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verses 3 through 12 tell this. For I deliver to you as of first importance... What I also received, that Christ died for our sins and according with Scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day accordance with Scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, then he appeared to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, uh, Paul writes, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then he appeared to the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also, for I am the least of the apostles. Unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and by his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though I thought I was not. But I, but the grace of God that is within me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach so that you may believe. Now in Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead. How can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? Paul sums it up so beautifully in 1 Corinthians. He says that it was not me, but the work of Christ through me. It was the work of God through me that saved me. But Paul says that he was not worthy to be saved because he killed his fellow brothers and sisters. But God loved him. Brothers, if you were their sisters, if you hear this gospel message, I pray that God will work a life in you. That he will change you and that your eyes will be opened and that your ears will hear that Jesus Christ is our risen Savior. God loves you. And he died. For you. Many, many years ago, on this day, Jesus rose from the grave. And he did it so that you may have everlasting life. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we come to you in prayer. And we praise your holy name. And we thank you, Father. That we can come and worship you and that we can sing praises to your name and that we can hear your word spoken and that we can know that Jesus Christ has died for our sins. We can know that you, our heavenly father, paved the way so that we may have eternal life. And that Jesus Christ gave his life as a ransom. And we praise you and we thank you. We thank you that we now have access to you and that Jesus, through his death, through his burial, and then through his resurrection, is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. But Heavenly Father, we look forward to when our King will return. We will look forward to when Jesus will return here on earth and that he will bring with him the kingdom and the millennial reign. And Father God, we praise you and thank you that we can be a part of this family. 
And I pray, Father, for all of those who do not know you as Lord and Savior, that you would use this gospel message and uh, hundreds of gospel messages around the world today that will be preached to reach out to those around us. That those who do not believe will have their eyes and ears opened to know you as Lord and Savior. And Father God, we love you and we praise you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. At this time, we are going to have a hymn of invitation. I'm going to step down in front of the pulpit. And though I can't be with you, I want you to take this moment to reflect upon what God is doing. If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I pray that you would begin to ask him to save you. That he would open up your heart, that he would open up your mind, and that you would know him as God. prayer for you as brothers and sisters in Christ is that if you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior just simply take a moment to say thank you that he gave his life as a ransom and my prayer is that you will begin to grow in a deeper relationship with him that you will begin to pray more read your Bible more and that you will begin to truly seek the face of God no matter what you face in this life, whether it's a quarantine, being staying at home with little ones, whether it's the loss of a job, whether it's losing a family member, the greatest thing that you can ever do is live for Jesus. When we leave this earth, when we either see the coming of our Lord and Savior or we leave this earth through physical death, we will see him. And I believe that Jesus is going to tell us, either well done, thy good and faithful servant, or he's going to tell us, depart from me, I never knew you. My prayer, my hope, is that you put your faith and trust in him. Not in me, not in a preacher, but in Jesus Christ. And that you will praise him, and that you will thank him. Our Father and our God, we love you and we praise you. And it is, Lord, that we thank you for this beautiful Easter day. And as we sit with family and loved ones, as we eat our Easter dinner and as we carry about our afternoon, let us always be thankful for the work that you've done. For sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to pay the penalty for our sins. Father God, we love you, and we praise you, and it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.